OOCS into a wider galaxy, part 121. Love and longing. Oh, come on now, Bali Zen. There's nothing to be ashamed about. A mother's instinct is a beautiful thing and not to be looked down upon. Miro Noir chides Bali Zen, who huffs at her. Not to mention, I don't think he wants that kind of help, Vernon remarks. Want or not, it's clear he needs help in some way. Bali Zen notes, he fights ferociously, but without much care for his own safety. He seemingly blocks and dodges, only to stay in the fight longer. What is this man's story? The full story. He is a clone of Herbert Jameson, one of the heads of undaunted intelligence, and one of the personal apprentices to the man that whipped it into the shape it is now. Herbert is also a huntsmaster and grand patriarch. Due to arrangement systems, he has a hundred brides between Zadin and Yaoya. He has hundreds of children, mostly sons thanks to human medicine. This man has been de-aged to someone just barely into puberty and takes vicious and unrelenting advantage of his young appearance. While interesting, what does this have to do with Harold? A clone is akin to a sibling unless... Oh dear, Harold has Herbert's memories too, doesn't he? That's right which means he remembers learning to love his wives, being there for the birth of his children, spending time with them, building and developing things. It may have been a relatively short period of time, but it's a time that Herbert will never forget, nor Harold, who has his memories. So Harold is trying to break away from an incredible man that's building things and has none of that which he values and at best is only tangentially connected to them. Yes, so he's clearly trying to push himself, but... So, who mentored Herbert? Two primary mentors, one was Sir Philip, who Harold has had some contact with, and the other was Grand Huntsmistress and Matriarch Isma, one of the more storied, old, and powerful Zedden known. Isma the Huntsmistress? Matriarch of the Sonier? Balizen asks, and Vernon nods. I see. Quite the mother and father. In addition to his actual mother and father on earth, he has a powerful lineage in teaching, and now, so little. Hmm. A branch that remembers being the trunk of the tree. That seeks to be the trunk in his own right. He needs roots, Bali Zen considers. Clone disassociation. It's fairly common, and if it happens in mass, then you get some really nasty situations. Strangely enough, Harold's reaction is downright benign compared to some of them. Copying memories into another body is never to be done lightly, Vernon notes. I suppose it would be compared to mass suicide and homicide of many clones waking up to find out that they're all just product, Miro Noir adds in. Of course the matchless would know about that. Someone mutters from the direction of the other princesses, and the nearby flower beds start growing rapidly. Pardon me? Vernon asks pointedly. I can fight my own battles, my love. Miro Noir states, and at Vernon's gesture, the flower bed starts returning to its standard size. But I want to fight for you, beloved, Vernon says. Then fight with me. Miro Noir bids him with a slight peck on the cheek. He pecks her back and they luxuriate with each other for a few moments. Then they both turn to the formerly tittering princesses. So what was that about my being the matchless? Miro Noir asks. Alarush, capital of the Goran Duchy, is a beautiful city and suited to being the seat of power to an old and prestigious family. Like many such capitals, there are smaller baronies within it that pay taxes to the duchy who in turn pays the empress. Technically, if something were to happen and the imperial family somehow ousted or vanished, the Goran would be one of the names on the board for who would succeed them, if it wasn't immediately obvious due to a successful coup or rebellion. Alarash is the main city that the Goran directly control rather than through proxy through their barons. It's designed with apoch sensibilities, stone near walkways and in any areas where tempers could flare, but carved wood and delicate glass away from where the powerful people might accidentally reduce it all to splinters and shards, or more likely charcoal and slag. To say nothing of the fact that every building has at least one window facing the walkway, with a simplified crest of the Goran family. It vaguely resembles the Freemason symbol, but is more simple, a crescent with a triangle sitting within it. Simple to the point and distinctive. Looks kind of like the silhouette of a sailboat. Such symbols are needed to help warring forces tell each other apart at a glance on the battlefield. That, in color, 
dark blue symbol on a white background or clear in the case of the windows, which brings Daiju to the van he's lying on top of and listening to things from. Things were just a bit off. There were too many Garan symbols on it. Most just had it on their license plates or a few stickers, maybe part of an official company logo to show that it's a provincial branch. But this van has it on both sides, the license plates and in each window, which could potentially be a sign of patriotism. But the shaded windows and the sheer newness, everything looked to be just made it ring a little false. There was no scuffing on the stickers or fading. So unless this was a big time Garan diehard that owned this van, then something was up. And a ninja needs to be down for whatever's up. Daiju smirks at that. Daiki had gone through a very brief but strange phase when he was a teen, and that was one of the many silly things he had said. There had also been a conversation in supposed English that had consisted entirely of the word, word. That had been near the end of it, as Dago had struggled long and hard to stop himself from laughing at his son's foolishness, and the strange conversation had proven the better against his self-control. Mr. What are you doing there? a child asks as a hoverboard descends from above. She's got baggy clothing designed to catch the wind on her silly little toy and has a large number of little chains with colorful baubles on the end hanging off her horns. For some reason, Daiju assumes for fashion, but he cannot imagine what's fashionable about looking like a hook to hang one's keys from. Currently, I'm laying down, also breathing on occasion, Daiju replies, and she seems confused. But why on a van? Why not on a van? Is there something wrong with this van? Daiju prompts. Local informants are a wonderful thing. Uh, yeah? Woman who owns it is a complete and total... What the pits are you doing hovering above my van again, you damn hoodlum? Get, get out of here before I call the guard to melt you damn toy to slag. A sharp voice barks out, and as the Tina Puck rockets away on her hoverboard, Daiju smirks to himself. Oh, this is too easy. As the woman comes to check her van to find if there are any dings, scratches, or damages, she finds nothing in on or around it. Damn brat, she growls. Every ten levels in the city are large platforms with jump pads from building to building and clear no-fly zones so that APUC leaping to and from don't come into contact with speeding vehicles. Regardless of who or what loses in that contest, the city loses due to litigation and the city wants to avoid that. Unfortunately for officials, teens are a rebellious sort, no matter the species, too strong and smart to tolerate being treated like a child, but nowhere near wise enough or experienced enough to actually pull off the things they're certain they can do. The problem is universal, teens are trouble, and to the meddling, trouble is useful. Hey there, Daiju says sitting on the edge of a roof as the teen blasts on by on her hoverboard. She stumbles struggles to keep her balance and nearly loses it. Would have lost it if her boots weren't locked onto it, requiring a switch on her left glove to disengage the magnetic lock. Not sure that's an official trick. Sure it is, it's called fighting for my life. What is wrong with you? You don't shout at people skyboarding. Sorry, but I do need to talk. Oh, oh, did my good looks get to you? She asked, tilting her head to the side and tinkling like someone shaking their keys. Actually, I'm doing some work for the duchy itself and need to talk with people to do it right. A girl that's going around looking to have fun? That's a great set of eyes. What? I'm doing a survey for the Duke, Daiju says as she steers her board over the roof and then disengages her bootlock to hop and then land on the board in a sitting position. Daiju cracks his neck as he turns to face her, keeping his body language casual and open to put her at ease. What you surveying? All sorts of things, things that, if I say directly, might get muddled with, so I'm just going to ask a bunch of questions, and you can answer them or not. And when that's done, you'll be able to play the day away, knowing you've done your service to the duchy. Um, okay, just questions? Just questions. Sure, I guess. Great. Now, you mentioned earlier that the woman that owns that van is really touchy. Is everyone like that, or is she just really rotten to be around? Oh, she's awful. I'd call her a bitch, but my best friend's a coirin, and I don't want there to be any splashback. That woman has something up her butt, and it ain't something fun, the teen exclaims. Oh, right. This is some kind of survey, right? My name is Vi Quen. Pleasure. Call me Daiyu. 
He says putting the slight hitch in his name, the Apoc do. Because why not? Oh? You don't look Apoc, Vi Quinn asks with a tilt of her head. I have Apoc in the family, he says entirely truthfully while lying his ass off. Oh, right, we were talking about that bitch. What about your Koiran friend? Oh, right, uh, never mind. That woman is a pain. She's always on edge and paranoid and acting like everyone's out to get her. She keeps screaming that whoever's bothering her is going to mess something up or whatever she's up to. I mean, damn woman, if you don't want to look like an idiot, don't try and fail to grab someone off a hoverboard by hand. She tried to swipe you off your board? Yeah, like an idiot. I got magnet boots. She says holding up her feet and the big soled boots she's got on have metal incorporated into the edges. Basic safety feature. When the magnets are on, I'm not coming off the board. Nice. So she tried to yank you off your board? Yeah. And then fell down like a dope. Then she started swearing like a seagirl. Seagirl? You know, from places like Sarla or Yath. Right. Geez, why do even adult men have to be lame? Viquin asks as she leans back on her board. Anything else? You seen anything weird beyond the really pissy seagirl? No. Wait, yes. I've seen her talking to others, and I think they're all seagirls too. They said something about something that expired or something? I don't know. One of them spotted me and spat a few fireballs after that. She's been even pissier ever since. Some people are just full of piss. Daiju notes, and she giggles. Yeah, I suppose. Any more bitches like that in the city? Daiju asks. Hey, don't go insulting Cory like that. Don't compare her to them. Geez, sorry, but I take it you've run into a lot of people like that? Oh, where do I begin? Viquen asks. Wherever you want, so long as I get all of it, that's all I care about. Is that what you're looking for? Troublemakers and stuff? Viquen asks, sitting up again. She pouts a little when Daiju puts a finger to his lips. Oh, fine. Anyways, Van Girl's just one of like 50 people. All of them a bunch of complete raging. You got their names? Daiju asks, having produced his communicator and is clearly taking things down. Oh, yeah, their names are... Cooling water splashes onto his face. He'd managed to avoid soiling himself as he got another Axiom brand. But there was just no getting used to that pain. There was just getting better at handling it. A few more splashes and he slicks back his hair before looking at himself in a mirror. The only thing that stands out is skinny. His face would be lost in an empty room. Then the door opens and Garia slithers in. She's in full war paint and would not look out of place in a heavy metal concert. What's wrong? He asks and she slithers up, grabs him in a hug and slithers out. What is going on? You pushed too far, too fast and nearly got yourself killed. What? Humans are null immune. I'm fine, but not explosion proof. Sure I am. Not while being nulled, you're not, she says, and then there is a blur and a pair of dark wings are wrapped around him with a tiny figure attached. Good. Are the others near Javra? Yes. I thought fighting the goddess was reckless, but she was powerful enough to set you aside unharmed. The princess is strong enough to hurt you, but not enough to stop you without hurting you. Chabra says, Oh, uh, you're still attached to the Zedin and Yaoya of Herbert. You whisper their names at times, Giri says as the door opens, and he sees both Dumia and Uma waiting on the bed. We are going to pin you down until today's bit of bad ideas blows over. But I need to get stronger. Yes, but doing it alive is the better idea. You're done for today. We're cuddling, Giri states in a dead serious tone. Oh, this is getting surreal. Yes, you have made it surreal. Me? OOCS Into a Wider Galaxy, Part 122, Not Exactly Hidden Ah, good. I was hoping that my work today wouldn't go to waste, Daiju remarks as he reveals himself within the Goran Estate. Incidentally, I found another passageway in and out. Looks like an old smuggling tunnel. Who are you and where did you come from? A young girl asks. She's the oldest of Hart Garan's children in taking the lead. I am me and I came from the old smuggling tunnel I found. It leads to a hidden entrance within the property. The small area in the gardens that exposes natural stone around bushes? Not so natural after all. 
Wonderful. That will need to be locked up or trapped, Hart Garan notes. I suggest traps. It's not on the blueprints, meaning that a learned enemy might not be aware of it, and a learned enemy might not be aware of your awareness of it, Daiju states. Father, who is this stranger? What are they doing in our home? She asks. This is Koga. One of the Koga, at least. He has been sent by the Empress. She fears the precarious position of the Goran might provoke dynastic warfare again, Hart Goran states. Yes, and I have some information for you. A list of suspected infiltrators within Alarush. I've spent most of my day verifying them and seeing who they talk to. I'm not totally certain if they're actually infiltrators, but they definitely need to be watched because they are up to something duplicitous, and if not hostile to you, then certainly illegal. How certain are you? Hart Garan asks. I'll match any wager you care to make and go into ruinous debt to get the initial coin for it, Daiju states before smirking. Law-abiding citizens don't make you, don't switch your conversation entirely when police are in the area only to return to that topic the moment they leave. No, they don't, Hart Garan agrees. And you got them to speak with you? I got them speaking. It wasn't with me. That just raises further questions. I was in disguise nearby and wearing a listening device on my back so I could hear them clearly when turned away. Oh, that would do it. A great many of the great feats are very simple at the heart of it. It's knowing where and when to be. That's the hard part. Daiju states as he then theatrically scans the room. Eight blood children, four adoptees. The adopted were children that had distant Goran blood in them, and their families had come to accident or random violence. The Empress is right to be concerned. There is some force slowly and systematically culling the Goran. Only one left that can officially hold power, eight blood heirs and then four more children, too young to hold power and very, very distantly related. So distantly that if they hadn't been formally recognized by Hart Goran, then there would be a stronger claim to the Goran by the surrounding duchies, or any number of internal barons. Not good. Is this all of them? No hidden heirs or children? Daiju asks. This is all that remains of the Goran, Hart Goran states. I see. Very well. I greet you all. I am Koga the Elder, a shinobi in the service of the Empress. She has sent me here to preserve your family line and prevent inner duchy competition devolving into outright war. Any questions so far? A small child raises her hand. Yes? What's a shinobi? Shinobi or ninja are effectively spies, messengers, occasional assassins, and above all else, survival experts. That last one is something I'm going to help impart into all of you. I will teach you all to recognize danger and how to escape it. Escape? Not fight? It's hard to fight when you've been peppered with arrows or riddled with rail shot in an ambush. The important part is to stay alive. So to that end, I will be getting you all good at recognizing danger, escaping, evading, and only after all that is done can you concern yourself with gathering your forces and striking back. Gathering? Not even just fighting them? Ganging up on someone is pretty much a guaranteed victory unless your opponent is in the same general skill level as a battle princess. Which is rare, Daiju says. My children. The beasts and rooting parataks are closing in on us. We can only fully trust the blood, but we also cannot simply throw away those not of the family. But we must cling to each other. We need to stand strong as one. Why aren't our mothers here? Or our nurses? Or... I know you're busy, but why aren't they here if this is so important? I overheard your mother receiving orders to subvert Goran and see it brought into the fold of her family's dynasty. Hart Garan says, and there are protests. All of your mothers have been subverted. I have the recordings. But even if there was no such risk and no such recordings, it wouldn't matter. You still need to do what he says. Daiju calls over them all. Yes, thank you, Koga. He is correct. Whether you believe me or not, it doesn't matter. The Garan is weakened, and we can only be stronger as a unified force. The chain of command from one generation to the last was brutally severed. No matter what happens, we were going to have a hard time of things, finding our balance among each other. You should have all had dozens upon dozens of cousins, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, and far, far more for family. 
A call from the clan head for the whole of the blood to gather in one place should have left us with so little room to spare that we would have to cooperate to get someone the room to go to the nearest bathroom. Instead, we are a mere 13 in number. Hart Garan makes a point of unballing his fists. There are small drops of blood from where his nails dug into his palms. We are nearly extinct, and I was too busy trying to maintain our wealth and power that I neglected you all. For that I am sorry, but no amount of apologies from me will make the path ahead any easier. I made us hard, but that us brittle. I will not allow our family to be shattered. And I will take my leave now. You have a good start. Call for Koga toward the darkened trees and I will return, Daiju says before suddenly vanishing. That was a sorcerer? The Empress can send sorcerers now? Yes, and evidently yes, Hart Gorin tells his children. Individual combatants can utterly shatter my ship and forces, Observer Wu says to himself. Hard and soft dangers on all sides, and the Apuk are very much the epitome of it. Hard and soft dangers? Uth Tyr asks. Hard I understand, but what's this soft danger? The fact that you just asked that question in a sweet voice with deep attention on myself is an example. Do remember that for all that humans appear to be the dream come true for lonely maidens the galaxy over. It goes in both directions. Really? Really? But the men and women of Earth are balanced. Why would there be anyone without someone? Things are far more complicated than that, Observer Wu says before the clearing of a throat draws his attention towards Miro Noir and Vernon. Suffice to say, some people might find it a problem for so many men to want nothing more than to leave Earth and join the greater galaxy, even if only as a boyfriend. Why is that a problem? Uthir asks. Men are the labor and warrior of Earth. Imagine if half the workers and defenders of the Tyr Barony were suddenly moving away. What would that do to you? Oh, Uthir notes. That, well... Miro Noir challenges her fellows with Vernon looming behind her. It's occasionally hard to put things together with the sideshow that is those two right there. Uth Tyr says, What's with the whole, the matchless title? Is it really so odd for a woman to be without a husband? No, but battle princesses are different. They are powerful, desirable, and desiring people. Miro Noir received many offers to join families, and it would not have been considered odd if she did so. However, she would not have been the head of them. At least not right away. It's all too easy for a battle princess to take the title of first wife away from the others if she so wants. But Miro Noir did not. Correct, she did not. She instead went on a search for an unattached bachelor. A rarity in and of itself, but even when she found a few, they weren't good enough for her. Really? Really? So you can imagine the surprise when there was news that she had finally settled down and found someone among the newest species, one that was assumed to still be a hoax by many. Hmm. Another thing we have in common. Are we still considered a hoax? Of course not. It's gone from a funny theory into a blatant denial of reality. Much like the truth of the galaxy at large is becoming on Earth, Observer Wu notes. From the looks of it, it's not a direct attack. Dicky notes as he goes over what Daiju brought back. Direct or not, it's still an attack. They're trying to financially destabilize the Goran Duchy through skirting the very edge of fraud, or at the very least false advertisement. Imagar notes and Daiju nods. To say nothing of these names, I did some digging, and a lot of them are tied to what seems to be nothing less than the grumpiest living being alive, downright allergic to fun. Almost as if they want the young and restless to be bored, frustrated, and feeling ever more oppressed by the system. Dale adds and Daiju claps his hands. Very good. Very, very good. Now what do we do about it? What do we suggest to our mutual friend Hart? Daiju prompts. Well, first off, he needs to clamp down on his symbol. That way he can jump on the near frog with both feet and stomp it out. Imagar says. And there's the issue of the complaints. If he introduces a fine for wasting police time, it might put a stop onto all these calls or a personal veto relaxing certain laws to make the claims even more spurious and clearly overblown than they are. Dale remarks, Yes, but he shouldn't be pronounced about it. This is not a fight that is to be had openly. The bloodline is down to 13 members after all, and only eight of them can inherit from Hart Goran without protest. The other ones are very distant relations. 
Relations whose families just so happen to be also departed. Correct. Which is why we are going to investigate the investigators who found nothing suspicious. An action like that must have left clues, and if they weren't found, then the investigators were either incompetent or on someone's payroll. So basic infiltration on the three separate investigation agencies and two private investigators that Hart Garan hired to look into this, Dikey says, looking over the notes. Does anyone want to call dibs on anything? I'll be taking two myself, Daiju states. So shall I, Daiki says, and both Dale and Imagar share a look. I think they want us to work together, Imagar says. I think you're right. Is there a reason for it? We're better trained and experienced, Daiki says. You're technically trained, but experienced? No, I'd say that's your grandfather, not you, Imagar replies. Daiki just smirks. Just watch me. I'll get my two done in the time it takes for you two to investigate any one of these five targets. Daiki challenges and Dale huffs before looking over the list. What do you say? Blue shell investigations sound like a good target? Dale asks. Without a bit more investigation out the gate, there's no way of telling which is the easiest. But a big corporation will have records of some kind. Bank statements and such, Imegar notes. Bidit's address is in Alarush. Let's go and see if Speedy McNinja here can actually do two while we do one. Sounds good to me, Dell replies, and both men step away from the little table. Wait, Daiju says, before pulling out a pair of dark blue towels. You'll need these. What? Dale asks and Daiki chuckles. Why would we need towels? Imagar asks. Is this a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy reference? Dale asks. Number it is a crucial ninja tool. What? Imagar asks, and Dale holds his up and examines it. Then starts wrapping it around his head until he ties it at the back. Then rips it off as he did it wrong and made it hard to breathe. Right idea, wrong method, Daiju says in Dale's size. Daiki snorts in amusement. One of six all-important tools you should always have, Daiki says. Right, because a towel is life or death. It can be, Daiju notes. How? Dropping down from above onto a hard surface can give away your position. Dropping down onto a soft towel makes much less noise, Daiju says, and both Dale and Imagar give him a look. That's right, my humor is backed by ancient wisdom. So listen well. OOCS into a wider galaxy, part one, two, three, not exactly hidden. Rock, paper, scissors, go, both men say, and hands crash into palms before. Scissors cuts paper, Dale says to Imagar. You're on distraction. Fine, Imagar states, turning away from Dale and looking down at the walkway leading to the office building to Blue Shell Investigations. Many higher-built buildings in Alarush have walkways connecting them, and this one is no exception. A combination massive apartment building and office with stores in food courts around the more easily accessed areas. The only thing stopping it from being a miniature arcology is that it still very much relies on the outside world for supplies and can't seal itself off. Blue Shell Investigation's main office is just above the second food court and right next to a bookstore. It's a small agency with only a few detectives, but they have a sterling record for being utterly relentless and pursuing jobs well and truly beyond what anyone expected which is why they were considered a nearly perfect for confirming a suspicious investigation. Of course, that also means that they have a reputation of being used as such, and anyone trying to cover up on them would bribe them. Naturally, it all adds up. It makes sense that if you want to move quietly, you blind, or more likely bribe, the eyes and ears used to hear you. Now they just need some proof, real proof, not circumstantial evidence. All right, so you go in the front, and I will check out the rear window to their office. They have rented space that goes all the way to the back, Dale says. Does this mean I have to take off the mask? Imagar asks, and Dale slowly turns to him. One masked face to another, and they both start laughing. You know it's kind of crazy, but this is exactly what I wanted to be as a child. A super space ninja? I liked Power Rangers, okay? Imagar protests and they both chuckle again. Five minutes later, Imagar enters the Blue Shell Investigations front office dressed as an Apuk man. 
He stands out due to his lack of makeup because Mira Noir, who looks like a Latina lady, is about as dark as Apu get. The fact that Dale sent him, a black man, to act as the distraction was a shit move. Which is why Imagar is shitting right back by pretending to be an Alpuk. Welcome to Blue Shell Investigations. We find anything from lost pets to lost loves. What can we find for you? The receptionist says and then blinks a few times as she takes in the horns and the tail swinging behind him. Some self-respect, to be honest, Imagar states. Actually, never mind. Anyways, I'm here because some wise guy took my spare horns. He then lifts the fake horns off his head. What? Yeah, my boss has weird requirements for the job I work, and apparently I have to at least look partially a puck. So fake horns and tail. Unfortunately, someone decided that it was funny to walk off with my spare false horns. I'm here to talk about possible prices for finding something like that, as opposed to the expense of making more. A slip of paper presses up against the latch and lifts it. Thank goodness the Apoc like their architecture with more retro sensibilities. Well, thank goodness for the sake of the man in the dark outfit that slips inside and then relatches the window behind him. A quick sense of things and... The sound of the door starting to open makes him shift out of general sight and into the shadow of a thick bookcase. Someone wanted to look fancy. In all likelihood, all the books had never actually been read. Everyone has communicators and data pads, after all. The very slight clicking sound of high heels lets him know exactly where the woman is. And as she approaches, he ducks down low at just the moment to stay out of anything but HTE edge of her peripheral vision. Her head turns, but he's moved mostly behind her and is still low. She turns further as she thinks she sees something, and he moves further, faster but still silent. Hmm. Must have been my imagination. She notes to herself as Dale gets behind her desk and she heads back to the window. She stares out for a few moments before heading to her desk. Dale keeps using it as a visual block between himself and her as she sits down and activates an inbuilt computer console. After a little bit of her typing to do her business, Dale rises up behind her and begins observing what she's up to. She seems to be an accountant and the overall leader of the organization. Unfortunately, unless she starts opening files, there's no way of telling what's going on. Whether or not they have been paid off to ignore something or... Hard funds. This place has a safe. A safe that legally has a fair amount of hard cash in there. There are also five investigators, two receptionists, and this woman on the payroll with someone else. Pointedly, not this woman in charge of the entire organization. So it's small and run by someone that... Someone that, if the emails are to be believed, is acting in a way that this woman, likely an Arnia Juke, if the messages are to believed, and the woman finishes her work and starts immediately browsing the local data network, looking at the news and such. Then a small message interrupts the browsing, and Arnia Juke sighs before clicking on it. Dale smirks under his mask. There are numerous questions about the cost of investigations, and whether it's worth it to even entertain a strange tret man wearing apuk horns and tail. Looks like Imagar has their attention. Arnia Juk looks at it oddly before standing up and walking out of her office, leaving her computer on. The moment the door is closed, Dale is up and has plugged in a data chip, does a file transfer of the records transferred over, and just barely has time to pull it out and duck away when she returns, turns off her computer, and then heads back out. Thank goodness these things have more RAM and a bigger memory buffer than any supercomputer on Earth. He slips up to the doorway and the side of his head goes up against it first. He listens, considers, and then cracks the door open. With the door open, he can hear the whispers of some distant conversation. Likely a break room or individual office that people are talking in. Office rumors. He slips out and quickly checks. First room? Hey, Lucky. Archives. Nice. He immediately starts going through their financial data and scanning things quickly, just trying to get a proper grasp on the dates. This business has been in effect for 50 years, and they need to narrow things down to the last five. The door opens, and an Apoc woman walks in, puts a data slate into a drawer, and then leaves again. As she closes the door, it reveals Dale behind it, and he moves back to searching through things again, this time focusing in the area she stored the slate and quickly narrows the area to the last five years. He then starts mass copying everything into data chips and goes back another five years for good measure. 
Then he taps on the tiny microphone hidden under his dark turtleneck. It makes a distinct sound that Imagar's earpiece picks up, and Dale starts on his extraction. Or in other words, he woodwalks out and leaves Imagar holding the bag. Because friends are just like that sometimes. Look, ma'am, it's clear that this just isn't worth your time. I'm sorry for wasting it. If it's going to take you this kind of time and effort to track down who's swiping my horns, I'll just find another answer. Sorry for wasting your time. Imagar apologizes before walking out in a seemingly annoyed state. Okay, he is kind of annoyed. Playing distraction is annoying when you can go out and get something more directly useful done. He makes his way through the building unmolested, making a point of taking off the false tail and bundling the horns and tail into a very obvious expanded bag and walks outside, then doubles back and buys a small snack. The Apuk do all sorts of things with meat, a lot of the guys are rather fond of the numerous bits of jerky made into shapes. A literal chain of parattack jerky is good stuff. Granted, it needs a bit of barbecue sauce here and there. But that's fine. He buys a party platter to make up for the fact that Apok just do not eat enough, then makes his way to the jump pad and launches himself up and off. The angle is a little off, making it look like the non apuk just didn't do things the proper Apok way by accident. Nothing to worry about. No one's hurt and he lands on the roof nearby Dale, who's taken his hood and mask off and has a bright jacket on that distracts from his dark clothes. You get it all? Imagar asks. I did the past decade of data from the blue shells, and that ought to be enough, Dale says and Imagar nods. Back home? I'd race you there, but... Imagar begins to say, and then both of them vanish to the dark forest mid-sentence. Oh, look at that. Koga can't magically do twice as much as two people. Who would have thunk it? Imagar states as they arrive back first. Time to sift through the stuff. Yes, that would be smart, Daiju says as he grabs a data chip and plugs it into his communicator to start browsing it. Dale slowly turns and finds Daiki there, with his hand outstretched. He wordlessly places a data chip into his hand. You know, there are better ways to motivate people into working fast but clean. Hell, that's kind of what we do by default. Yes, but where's the fun in that? Also, we were nearby in case either of you needed help. You didn't, so we let you at it. Daiju replies as he starts browsing through quickly. Hmm. This is a little too far back, but it is a good baseline for standard operations. And the other four? In a moment, we're doing this correctly. Besides, it's not like we need to wait for business hours if we take too much time, Daiki says. Maybe, but someone on the other side may lose patience considering that this is one of the few times in their borderline endless lives they're actually on a time crunch. Imagar protests and the Kogas look up and share a look and then a nod. That's a good point. Store this all here. You two are our reinforcements if things go wrong. Come, my grandson. Show me how you infiltrate, Daiju says before nodding. Everyone puts down the data chips and nod. Then the room is suddenly empty. Father? Do you hate mother? His daughter asks in heart Garan's sighs. There are no strangers nearby, and despite everything, the guard must come down. Otherwise, there will be no bringing people together. Without the shield he's used to keep safe, is he even strong enough to stand? Hate is not the word. I am cautious. Your mother has loyalties beyond me and would make the Goran part of them, or at the very least is being pushed to. He tells her, Zanigaran, you have your mother's blood of Sarla, yes, but you are within the Goran line, which means that there are many people who would rather see you as Sarla than Goran. What's wrong with being a Sarla? Mother's a Sarla. She is, and it suits her. The problem is, is that things like this tend to continue. If the Sarla eat the Goran, then do your sisters become Sarla too? Remember only three of you, including you, have Sarla blood. What about your Farlet sisters, your Darv sisters, or your adoptive siblings who are by blood distant cousins? What happens to them? Why would they continue? Because of momentum. It's a basic truth that once something starts, it often takes just as much effort to stop it. But that's silly. When you walk, it's easier to stop than keep going. Zenigaran protests. You think so? Or is it because all kinds of moving is being fought by gravity in the air? But then wouldn't things like that stop the Sarla from eating the Garan? It's not that simple. And while it would stop them eventually, 
It's like stopping you from taking two steps. We'd need air thicker than water and a lot of gravity to stop you from doing that. Oh, I still don't get it, though. Mother says the Sarla are great, which is why it's long past time I teach you all about the Quran, so you can all understand why we must fight to keep our family alive, why it is worth protecting and preserving, and not just because we won our duchy in battle. OOCS into a wider galaxy, part one, two, four, love and longing. Mr. Shea, we need to speak. Observer Wu states as Mira Noir awaits an answer about exactly what her fellows have been saying behind her back. I, go ahead, darling. Without the big bad bloody prophet, they might deign to speak to the matchless. Mira Noir says with a bit of a pointed barb to their fellows. Matchless, my rear. Vernon says, giving her a deep kiss. Can I have another when I come back? Yes, my Vernon, you may. She gushes and they rub noses together for a moment before he steps away from her and towards Observer Wu. Very well, sir. I am at your disposal. Thank you. If you could step a little away so we don't interrupt or are interrupted by your wife's politicking. When you're more or less special forces, Office politics can get pointed, Vernon says in a neutral tone as he follows observer Waito, the opposite side of the garden. Thank you. Now you are an axiom expert among the undaunted, correct? One of the better users? I am. You have also pioneered a shortcut to mastering one of the most complicated and powerful axiom out of styles in the galaxy, correct? Yes, transmutation is a justly feared art. The ability to turn any one thing into anything else lets you do anything up to and including the complete destruction of markets through oversaturation of scarce resources. Like that trick you did to turn air into gold. You saw my message to my family. I have. It was quite the thing to see. Watching a man display that the monetary system is his toy if he has even the slightest inclination to such. Value is often tied to scarcity Take out the scarcity and you can remove something's value. It's why known transmutation adepts like me get an unofficial visit from whatever government there is wherever they go, Vernon explains. Really? Oh yes, in an emergency, I could be asked to create an important but rare resource. A warship that's had its axiom ride ripped out of its drive core might contract me to replace it and then use the money they'd use to buy the Axiom ride to repair the core and use it to post a bounty on the head of whoever took it, with the hunter being permitted to keep the Axiom ride as added incentive. Has that happened often? Twice, Vernon states. Huh. So what do you want to know about Axiom in particular? It's not the Axiom, it's the alignment of things. You're more or less a human expert on the entangables of the galaxy, but so little of it makes sense. How and why do they resemble us so much? Not just physically, but mentally? They're a costume and culture away from being human. This doesn't make sense. If the galaxy is pure mathematics with no intangibles, with nothing resembling the mystic or the spiritual, then you are right, this is impossible, Vernon says before holding up a hand. Fire blossoms in his palm before vines snake out of his sleeve and consume the flames whole before flowering. But there are intangibles. They are demonstrably provable, even in cruel space. There are particles and structures that alter depending on how they are being observed. That means they're reacting to consciousness. But that's understandable. Stop being so materialistic about things. There is more than just molecules and atoms to the universe. It is more than just energy and empty space in varying degrees. There is more. So much more that trying to understand it all is simply beyond us mere mortals. Are you a religious man? I didn't used to be, but I've seen so much, understand so much, and have been humbled so many times that I have begun to truly believe. There is a divine force, a pattern, a design, and humans fit in that design, as do all living things. Assuming you are correct, that leaves the question to what it is and why. Yes, two of the oldest questions in human history where entire societies turn over the assumptions towards those answers. It's absurd, Observer Wu states. Absurd? What's absurd is expecting to somehow understand all things, 
and being offended when you don't. It's the height of hubris thinking you can know it all, and the more I understand, the more I understand that above all else. So in other words, you just don't know why all aliens can look so much like each other and us, Observer Wu asks. Number nor do they, and they've been looking into it for far, far longer than any civilization we've had has existed, Vernon states. And you trust their methodology? I do, Vernon says simply. Without explanation? There is no explanation needed. There is no flawless method to anything. And to be frank, the more I look at a lot of the science back home, the more I realize our own methodologies and techniques just don't work. It's too much of a popularity contest and not enough of an academic pursuit, Vernon states. But that's neither here nor there. You're asking me about a subject that goes from axiom theory to biology, from theology to quantum physics, and then into anthropology and sociology. Every single field of scientific inquiry has their own theories as to why the galaxy is the way it is, and they contradict each other a lot less than you'd think. And in general, it all boils down to the idea that there is a plan of some kind. Whether it's from a divine lord, some great spirit, the will of the galaxy itself, or just the first pattern to exist, repeating itself, infinity, it doesn't matter. Because the pattern is here, and humans fit into it. While we can recognize the pattern from our position of inside it, we can't get the full view. We have to correlate with other species, perhaps with all species if we're to get a full and proper perspective on life. But all species are not here. Some are already extinct. Others have not evolved yet. Some may have been prevented from ever evolving due to our own efforts or hubris. So you're saying the answer is impossible to find. No, I don't believe there is such a thing as an unanswerable question. But the question of why things are the way they are is very much not something I can answer, and it's not something that anyone can currently answer, Vernon states. Very well, different topic then. How easy is axiom to use? The basics are a mere act of will. You need to get a small feel for things or talk through it. But beyond that, beyond that is just individual practice. And for many people, it's not worth the effort. Considering that within less than a year, you were rearranging matter at a base level, I have to wonder how lazy people are to think something like that isn't worth it. Considering that advanced technology is so ubiquitous and easy to use, it very much seems like a silly anachronism to most of the galaxy to practice it. And then you get to the level of an adept. Someone who actually knows what they're doing and understands the process. That's when things get dangerous, powerful, and very, very useful. But it's still ignored? What's easier for creating a high-intensity fireball? Studying and practicing with obsessive focus for weeks on end or picking up a plasma pistol? Getting the pistol at most takes five minutes of research, maybe two hours of travel time at the extreme outside edge, and a couple hundred in credits for a cheap one. If you want to go from one place to another, you can study the myriad of teleportation techniques which require precision and focus. Or you can call an auto cab for so cheap that some apartment leases include unlimited cab use as part of the rent. Really? In a major city, you can get a yearly pass for less than the plasma pistol, Vernon says and Observer Wu nods. I think I'm starting to see now, which now brings us to the next point, which is... You're fairly deep in the romance scene, correct? Pick any five seconds I'm with my mirror noir, and you won't have to ask that question. What are the marital traditions you know about? There are many of them. The oath dance is one, for instance, a dance and song designed to seduce the husband. It can be very formal or not, but it's considered fairly formal. For the most part, the galaxy over, however most women simply, claim a man, and that's all. I think it evolved from a social pressure to lock a man down as quickly and thoroughly as possible, rush through things so that they have some authority to push another girl away. Really? Yes, but that's one of those things that's not really official anywhere. Just a social norm that's been floating around for so long, it's effectively an unspoken law. Any others? This one of those things that if I start even listing off examples, we're going to be here for a very long time. Each species has its standards and each culture within the species has their own. Gobs share shiny gifts and more primitive ones will carve skull-shaped jewelry, 
As such, Admiral's cistern has a collection of hand-carved jade necklaces and rings that make it look like he plundered an Aztec temple. Many feathered races consider it very romantic to give your husband a feather to wear, and martial cultures will give weapons at times, which is why the hat with the enormous plume in it that Admiral Cistern occasionally wears is a big statement of intent from Lady Tickenped that feather is both a weapon and a part of her, making it extremely romantic and definitive from Pavora's perspectives. Hmm. So there are more traditions than can be practically named. Exactly, and they run the gamut from romance and woo the other party to jump on them, and if they don't try to run away hard enough, then it counts as a yes. Have you encountered anything like that? Not personally, but there have been a few men that have met that. Granted, you can understand the reasons why. Trauma baked into a species' DNA tells them to get the man, get him to safety and keep him there, and the only place they trust as safe is the reinforced bunker they personally set up. Legally, it's usually a kidnapping. Culturally, it's a rescue. What species do I have to avoid? Charbus, short bee women, flight capable, painful sting, but the poison is even milder than a bumblebee. But they have an attitude you'd swear they evolved from wasps or hornets. Wait, Eastman. Hoagie? Yeah, he's the poster child for being jumped by Charbus. He's the beating heart of a hive 200 adults strong. I don't remember how many newly hatched daughters or sons he has now. But the man again, poster child for being jumped and bonding with his captors, minus the implied Stockholm Syndrome. Minus? Bonding with your captors is Stockholm Syndrome, Observer Wu states and Vernon shrugs. Hoagie says he's fine. We gotta trust him on things like that. But you don't know? No. But he's had countless chances to ask for evac, backup, or to just escape outright. So we have to assume he's there voluntarily. Apparently, B-girls make a mean sandwich, Vernon says, and Observer Wu gives him an unimpressed look. What? Nothing. And that's the sixth time, Harold notes in amusement. He and his wives are all sunk mostly into a comfortable couch, with Giria's tail acting like a backrest. Shh. Delicious man abs on screen. Uma says, and Harold raises an eyebrow and gently takes her hand before tucking it up under his shirt. Mmm, man abs. Although yours aren't the nice type. Excuse me. Yours are hard. I could break something on these. Der Kemka has more cuddly ones, she teases. His are for show, mine are for strength. Yours are a sign that you need more fats in your diet. Uma teases, but pointedly does not stop running her hand over his abs. I'm sure. You know, I bet I could take him, Harold notes. He's the equal of two battle princesses. You couldn't beat two. Uma protests. I think I'd take him easy, Harold says and Javra snorts. There's a difference between a character and the actor, right? I mean, they have little kids play, acting the parts of hunters, playing out what they heard from their moms and aunts. Doesn't mean their moms and aunts didn't rip down all sorts of big bad beasts. Javra explains and Harold shrugs. I could still take him. I'd like to see that, Dumia remarks before her wing flaps against him a little. Now stop talking over the movie. Harold lets out a huff of amusement as he leans back and Giria's tail shifts a bit behind him to give him a sort of half hug as he leans on her. He looks to where her face is and she smiles. He nods. This... This is helping. OOCS into a wider galaxy, part 125. Not exactly hidden. Androgynous ass Asians, Imagar mutters, and the Koga scoff in unison at him. They don't look like themselves. They look like two different secretaries. Down to the horns, tails, feminine build, and the slight mole that one of them has. It's downright surreal. Well, it doesn't matter how pretty and pink our master ninja are. The only questions are, did they get the stuff and did anyone notice? Dale asks, and then catches the data chip tossed his way. Technically not an answer. There could be anything from a local restaurant's menu to hardcore slob porn on this. Wait, slobes are basically just living protoplasm around a hyperdense organ core. They reproduce by budding, how would you, why would you, 
Don't ask questions you don't want the answer to, Dale says. I know the mechanics of how, and I know why, I just can't see it being particularly enjoyable, Imagar states. Don't knock another man's fetishes, it's bad form. Daiju says still looking like a dainty apoc woman, but forcing his voice down as low as it can go to just add to the surreality of the statement. X fucking excuse me, you know what? Number we're not going down that path. Both of you get out of your disguises. You both pull off dresses far too well for me to be comfortable with you, Imagar states, and there's some laughter before Imagar throws down a smoke bomb. And to his relief, both other men are dressed normally and just look like stereotypical ninjas with glasses. Because why the hell not? All right, time for the boring part. Aren't you looking forward to it? One of the two ninja asks in an excited tone, and Imagar immediately pegs that one as the elder. The younger is more responsible unless he's already been corrupted. Right, now you also... Dale begins and they all pause as they hear something through the forest. Well then, both Koga are gone in wood walks. Both Imagar and Dale quickly change into their own ninja outfits and follow. Ah, good, you're... Doubled. Hart Garan notes as two Koga arrive. Ah, here with Grandfather and... Two more people dressed identically show up, except with sunglasses instead of normal glasses and a clearly different size and skin tone on the hands. Are more to come? Eventually, you know me, my grandson, and these are our apprentices. Any questions? Sorcerers all? Yes. Terrifying, Hart Gurin notes. So have you found more than a list of potential troublemakers? We suspect that one or more of the investigative organizations that looked into the ills surrounding your family may have been paid off. We've just freshly gathered the last decade of reports and financial data from all of them, and we're about to go over them when you called us, Daiju states and Hart Garan nods. Good. If you could help me in instructing my children how to find methods of escape and secret passages, I've managed to impart the importance of their survival to them. Yes, and after... They can help us all sift through the files of the organizations we plundered. It is important to learn how to properly evaluate documents and read through financial data. Imagar offers, and both Koga turn to look at him. Is it a bad idea? No, but a bit much for children. Then we the adults best not make mistakes. It is a good idea, Hart Garan says. We must come together after all, and if we are all working towards each other's survival, then it shall help. The training had gone well, and they had progressed into getting the kids to help out reading through the files, which was a struggle as this is a dry topic at the best of times. More than half bow out and start a quiet argument over what to watch on the hollow projector until Dale grabs the remote and puts on a popular movie. Having something actually playing beats out what may be playing, and they watch. Here we go. Look here. Every single one of our suspects received a regular payments from the same source at monthly intervals. It started the same month you put the bounty on the pirates and continues now. We're going to have to check, but I'm willing to bet that someone saw opportunity and through this company, a shell company literally called Hard Shell Construction, they've been paying off all investigators to let them move in your area with ease. I see it here too, Hart Gurren says. It's for continued service in this period, and the first is appropriate discretion. So that makes hard shell construction the next target, Dikey notes. You get started on that, Junior. I'm going to double and triple check things here. See if anyone lets something slip, Daiju says, and Daiki nods as he rises up. Why the masks? One of Hart's daughters, Dalagaran, asks. Tradition, mostly. But traditions are important. They remind you where you came from. Where did it start, she asks. Ninjas are about sneaking around and moving without being spotted. This makes us good messengers and spies during wars, which is why a lot of people liked us. But skin doesn't blend in well with shadows or with grass or leaves, so you need to cover it up. That's one reason why we have masks. Oh, okay, what's another, Dalla asks. Well, it's a mask. If they don't know who's running around and spying for the other guy, then they catch you so easily. Dale says before pointing to Imagar and then Daiju. I mean, it's clear that I'm not him or him, but beyond that, do you know anything about me? Um, uh, you're a man, a sorcerer, 
and not enough puck? And since you can't check for a sorcerer easily, how do you tell me apart from any non-apook man in the galaxy? Dale asks. Uh, I don't know. Exactly, Dale says. Makes sense? I guess. Dalagaran notes in a baffled tone. Considering she's barely into her double digits, it's understandable confusion. Hmm. Well, 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 this is interesting. Daki's voice wafts over from where he's researching. If you're not going to say it, then keep the baited hooks to yourself. Imegar cuts off Daiki, who sighs as Daiju chuckles. There are numerous remarks already about hard shell construction being a front or a money laundering operations, and several people noting that they never seem to actually construct anything. What? That's definitely something I need to see. Excuse me, Hart Garan says before joining Daiki in his studies. Hmm, not good. I think I will be helping you gentlemen on your next infiltration. As distraction, I hope, Daiju says. Correct. Although a low-profile bodyguard nearby would be useful. Me and Dale got that. No problem, Imagar says. Well, that seems to be everything then. Why will you be visiting them, though? Simple. If there are already rumors running around, and I want to be seen as a respectable and responsible heir to the duchy, then it behooves me to check, won't it? Whether there's substance to them or not, they're going to give me the runaround. But that will put their eyes on me leaving you two with the run of the base. Yes, but a duke showing up with two random tret-looking fools for bodyguards? Kind of suspicious, Dale says, and Hart Garan nods before smiling. The Barless? The Barless. They are, after all, joining the local police force as we speak, Hart Garan notes. We move tomorrow. That will give the Barless the prep time they need and time enough to go over what we already have again and find any details that we failed to notice the first time through. Agreed, Daiju says. Grandson, that was not your sign to stop researching earlier. I want to know everything about hard shell construction up to and including their political opinion on coffee being an intoxicant to many species. Hart Garan nods as Jade Barless and three of her clan members arrive with him. All of them dress semi-formally and with openly carried laser rifles and an ornamental, but functional, sword with the crest of the Garan strapped to their sides. Time for the show. Dale gets the door as Imagar holds a briefcase. Both are formally dressed, Dale with gloves and a cap, Imagar with a suit pressed so precisely a laser would be needed to find a crease. Tret driver and lawyer, Apoch bodyguards for public appearance. He is every inch the non-combat duke. Hardshell Construction's main office looks like an area typical to a construction company's office. Built into a strip mall, an unassuming if not for the numerous large vehicles in the outback parking lot and several motorhomes that no doubt serve as mobile offices, which is why his arriving causes a big splash. One big enough that it completely conceals the shadow slipping in the back door and the other checking the containers and mobile offices. Two barless step through the doorway first and ensure that Hart Garan is flanked as he walks up to the front desk. His face is stoic as a mountain. Can I, um, can I help you, my lord? The fact the receptionist looks ready to run is telling. Hart Garan holds out his left hand, and Imagar opens his briefcase and brings out a device. Hart Garan activates it and places it on the counter. You are under ducal inspection. There are numerous concerns about your business and it is my business to ensure that the laws in my land are respected if they are not being precisely followed. The concerns about this being a money laundering operation are numerous and varied, leading to my being concerned. Of course, my lord, the head of this office is currently unoccupied as far as I am concerned. Bring them here, Hart Garan orders. But she's on her lunch break. Then recall her, or do I need to have your general education diploma redacted as you clearly cheated? Hart Garan threatens and her jaw drops. But that is within my power. Recall your employer from her lunch break. We need to talk. Hart Garan states and she gawks at him. Must I send you back to public education in shame? No, sir. I mean, my lord. Then summon her. Now. He orders and she picks up a communicator. Meanwhile, in the back, Daiki slowly edges his way around a vicious-looking pet. It's some kind of ground bird with a jagged beak he can't identify offhand, but it's currently napping very lightly and clearly is not to be toyed with. Killing the creature is out of the question, 
and there's a detector on the thing's neck, which will likely tell the owner if it's been forced to sleep with Axiom. A very, very solid and intelligent defense, but when he's still inching his way around, although inching is probably the wrong word, most people walk at this pace. He can sneak at it. While his grandson is dancing his way around the cross between a carnivorous toucan by way of a cassowary, Daiju is slipping into the main office of the leader of Hardshell Construction and has already guessed the password. Honestly, line-of-sight passwords are stupid. It only took him two tries to guess that it was her daughter's hatch day and name, both of which are clearly marked on the year calendar on the wall. What grabs his attention is an email that is signed at the end with the image of a hand-drawn symbol. Two diamonds, side by side in a circle. All of it in yellow, the darv. It also makes numerous references to allies and... His hairs stick up and he exits everything and puts it into sleep mode before ducking away and out of sight. A full three seconds later, and a woman teleports into the room. Daiju's heart is hammering as he mentally congratulates himself for getting to the level of borderline clairvoyance for his reflexes. His ancestors would be proud if they could find him. She leaves the room instantly and he quickly gets back on her computer and copies the evidence, then shuts it off again and follows her out. He was quick, so he actually sees her leave the hallway and enter the main reception. Hart Garan is ready for her. She outright flinches when his gaze shifts to her and she clearly contemplates running, despite him having no reputation for battle nor a weapon. The story of what he did to the pirates responsible for the Garan massacre and his clearly pissed off but controlled state are enough to put her on edge. Hello, I am Marl War, current head of Hardshell Construction. What is so important that I'm going to be working hungry the rest of the day? Your little organization has been accused repeatedly and from a wide variety of sources of being a front and money laundering operation. I am here to ensure that my duchy is free of such taint. Or you are investigating me and mine when there are numerous criminals and... She stops as his eyes flick to something behind her. It's impossible not to notice when his gaze feels like a blade held to the throat. Her heart nearly stops as she's suddenly aware of a figure in black directly behind her. His eyes hidden behind glasses that reflect her own fear as he throws a data chip around her and into the waiting hand of the Duke. He plugs it into the small projector on the table and she tries to step away only for a strong hand on her shoulder to stop her. One of the bodyguards leans forward and begins to read it. The following funds are to bribe all known investigative and detective agencies up to and including freelancers and local police in order to keep all reports relating to the following individuals to you first for editing and redaction. The DARV symbol follows and after that is a long and exhaustive list of every branch of the Gorin family still living in the duchy, Hart Gorin says icily. This is treachery. No, this is clearly planted, my lord, please. This lunatic has me pinned and... Contain her in the forest, Hart Gurren says. She starts to collapse like a puppet with her strings cut and then vanishes. The receptionist screams before Dale reaches over and grabs her. She fights the axiom effect, but her focus is broken when vines grow out from under his sleeve to tie her up. She is then knocked out and sent to be right beside Marlwar in the dark forest. Hart Garan takes a deep breath, his axiom presence screaming his fury as he outwardly looks calm. Then with only a slight frown, he nods to the room. I want all of them, and I want their secrets in a pretty little row in front of me. The ninjas move, the barless follow, and around an unmoving but utterly furious Hart Garan. Hard shell construction is looted down to the flooring within the hour.